हेलो एवरी वन आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू गुड इवनिंग एंड आई होप एवरी थिंग इज स्ट्रीमिंग वेल एंड गोइंग फाइन इफ यस गिव क्विकली गिव मी अ थम्स अप एंड अ क्विक कन्फर्मेशन दैट वी आर ऑल ओके विद द ऑडियो विजुअल्स ओके सो गुड इवनिंग गभावेश गुड इवनिंग नरसिम्हा कुमार एंड टुडे आई एम कम आई हैव कम अप विद दिस हंड्रेड वन लाइनर्स इन ई एन टी एंड दिस इज एस्पेशली फॉर दो स्टूडेंट्स हुर अपियरिंग फॉर द आई एन आई सी टी एग्जामिनेशन एंड द मेन थिंग इज टुडे आई विल नॉट स्ट्रेस अप ऑन मेनी ऑफ द डिफिकल्ट थिंग्स बट टू डू बेसिक थिंग्स करेक्ट बिकॉज वेन वी आर क्लोज टू द एग्जामिनेशन द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट वी नीड इज डेफिनेटली द कॉन्फिडेंस एंड द सेकेंड थिंग इज यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू फील आउट ऑफ द ब्लू और यू नो यू नो डोंट डोंट वॉन्ट टू फील दैट वॉट इज दिस आई हैवेंट लर्न दिस आई फॉट इन दिस सो ह्यूर आई एम टू जस्ट क्विकली यू नो रिकैप्चुलेट द एंटायर ई एन टी इन अ क्विक समरी ऑफ हंड्रेड वन लाइनर्स टू बूस्ट योर कॉन्फिडेंस एंड टू मेक यू फील दैट येस i have prepared well for my examination and to go to the examination with that kick and with that morale that yes i know everything so are you all ready for it if you are let's start the class so i would want you all to answer quickly in the chat box when i am doing the one liner so that i know how much you have understood or how much you have recollected if you have forgotten something or if there is any if there is a specific thing that you don't recall then let me know in the chat box i will be able to help you better okay so fine so first question so we start from otology do pharynx larynx and then mix of everything so here which structure develops from all the three germinal layers which structure develops from ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm so can you tell me which structure i am waiting for your answers yes yashasvi narsimha very good uh, the answer is tympanic membrane so tympanic membrane develops from all the three germinal layers so this is the right answer Uh, we know the development quickly to recapitulate the development part of the ear the external auditory canal develops from the cleft of the first arch the pinna is made up of cartilage so it develops from the mesoderm of the first and second arch the middle ear with the eustachian tube comes from the endoderm of the first and second arch and the tympanic membrane comes from all the three germinal layers okay the persistence of petrosquamous suture what is this called as what is if persistent petrosquamous suture is present what do we call that as what do we call a persistent petrosquamous suture line we call it as ks septum what is that ks septum i know most of you already know this answer but i'm still waiting for your answer very good this is called as corner septum so corner septum is nothing but persistent petrosquamous suture line now coming to the third option we have three ossicles in our uh, ear we have the malleus we have the incus and we have the stapes good evening priyanka so i'm trying to make this session quite quick because we're just two days away from the examination i don't want to take a long session so just a quick uh, briefing to all of you that this is going to be just half an hour 45 minute session in 100 questions i'll finish quickly like this in half an hour 45 minutes this is just going to be a run through session to just recapitulate your memory on ent okay so we won't waste much of the time so malleus and incus develop from which arch they develop from the mesoderm of which arch they develop from the mesoderm of the first arch whereas stapes has got two parts it has got a supra structure and it has got a foot plate so, so stapes supra structure develops from which arch from the mesoderm of the second arch and the foot plate develops from yes the foot plate develops from otic capsule so the stapes develops from the second arch except its foot plate and annular ligament which develops from the otic capsule okay i hope this is clear to everybody so i hope you have recollected the embryological part very quickly now coming to the boundaries of the middle ear so quickly tell me the floor of the middle ear is related to what structure <clears throat> so what do we have on the floor of the middle ear floor is related to what so in the floor of the middle ear there is a very important vein which is that vein very good the floor of the middle ear is related to internal jugular vein the roof of the middle ear separates the middle ear from which cranial fossa what is this middle cranial fossa so what is this roof called as 
the roof is formed by a thin plate of bone which is called as excellent many of you are answering it absolutely right it is called as tegment tympani so tegment tympani is the roof of the middle ear and floor of the middle ear is in relation to the internal jugular vein medial wall has two main structures the basal turn of cochlea forms the promontory then we have got the lateral semicircular canal we have the oval window above and the round window below and a projection which is called as cochleariform process the nerve which travels from the medial wall and goes to the posterior wall is your facial nerve so posterior wall has got two structures it has got the pyramid so posterior wall has a projection called as the pyramid and it has a communication called as the aditus anteriorly we have the opening of eustachian tube above that there is a canal for tensor tympani muscle and below that we have the internal carotid artery so this is a quick revision of middle ear i know this is going a little too fast but since this is a revision session i want to finish maximum topics in a quick time so that is why it is like this if you have any specific doubts please do let me know in the chat box i'll be more than happy to help all of you okay so dash is used as a surgical landmark to locate the mastoid antrum so what is used as a surface landmark surgical landmark to identify the mastoid antrum there is a triangle what is the triangle called as very good shubham sharma very good narsimha yashasvi avinash excellent that is called as mac evans triangle so mac evans triangle is the surface landmark for identifying the mastoid antrum now the inner ear lies in which part of the dash bone so there are many bones in our skull so i'll give you the clue this is the temporal bone so in which part of the temporal bone do you have the inner ear i'll give you the options if you want is it in the mastoid part petrous part is it in the squamous part or the tympanic part which part of the temporal bone do you have the inner ear very good avinash the answer is petrous part of the temporal bone so in the petrous part of the temporal bone we have the inner ear now where is the electrode placed in the cochlear implant surgery so in which window i'll give you the clue is it placed through the oval window or round window and if it is through one of the window then in which compartment of the cochlea so in a cochlear implant we insert an electrode into the cochlea in out of the three in one of the compartments so which compartment and through which window yes i am waiting for your answers so we place the electrode through the round window into the scala tympani of the cochlea so through the round window in the scala tympani of the cochlea so we insert the electrode through the round window into the scala tympani of the cochlea okay so it was i think stuck for a minute or so i think now it is better i hope it's better now i guess it will be better in a while just there was some fluctuation but now i think it's better okay okay so the dash is the most common route of infection in acute suppurative otitis media and the most common site of perforation of the tympanic membrane in asom is the dash so quickly answer this question which is the most common route from the external auditory canal via the hematogenous spread or via the eustachian tube so which is the most common route of infection in asom and what is the most common site of perforation of the tympanic membrane i'm waiting for your answers so the eustachian tube is the most common source of infection for asom som csom whatever it is uh, the most common source of infection is 
through the eustachian tube and the most common site of tympanic membrane perforation in asom is the antero inferior quadrant so it is in the antero inferior quadrant okay shubham it's not blood it is through the eustachian tube okay and the most common site of perforation is a is antero inferior quadrant okay so dark night we take a incision for myringotomy in postero inferior quadrant but when the pus releases in the stage of resolution when the pus comes out of the tympanic membrane it will result in a perforation in antero inferior quadrant but when you want to do a myringotomy to release a pus then you do it in the postero inferior quadrant so i hope you get the difference that naturally you will see it in the antero inferior but if there is a uh, you know you have to make a myringotomy then you choose the postero inferior okay in serous otitis media dash incision is made in the dash quadrant of the tympanic membrane so in serous otitis media what type of incision will you take will you take a radial incision or will you take a curvilinear incision and in which quadrant of the tympanic membrane will you take this incision so in serous otitis media if you have to do a myringotomy you will take a radial incision in which quadrant in the antero inferior quadrant so radial incision in the antero inferior quadrant is what you do for serous otitis media but if it is an acute saturative otitis media then you do it in the postero inferior quadrant a curvilinear incision okay dash sign is specific in acute mastoiditis the reservoir sign is a specific sign that you see in acute mastoiditis so if they ask you which is the specific sign for acute mastoiditis then it is the reservoir sign is it stuck or is it fine now is it still stuck or is it fine now i think it is better now okay so reservoir sign is a specific sign seen in acute mastoiditis battle sign is seen whenever there is a middle cranial fossa fracture so whenever there is a fracture of the middle cranial fossa then you see the battle sign otherwise what you see is the reservoir sign okay dash is the most common benign neoplasm of the middle ear and they originate from dash cells so can you tell me which is the most common benign neoplasm of the middle ear i'll give you an clue this is a hormonal secreting tumor they secrete catecholamines epinephrine nor epinephrine dopamine presents to you with bleeding on examination you will see a rising sun appearance there is a pulsatile tinnitus what are we talking about yes so what are we talking about which is the most common benign neoplasm of the middle ear and they originate from dash cells very good i'm very happy to see most of you have answered it right so we are talking about glomus tumor glomus tumor is the most common benign neoplasm of the middle ear and they originate from the paraganglionic cells paraganglionic cells are the cells of the sympathetic nervous system and since they come from the paraganglionic cells which are the cells of the sympathetic nervous system they secrete catecholamines the catecholamines like epinephrine nor epinephrine and dopamine okay so we are pre- talking about glomus tumor and uh, uh, sirshendu jna is that lesion of the nasopharynx we are talking about middle ear 
so gna doesn't come here okay both of them will have tumors which have blood vessels like the tunica media so both of them will present to you with bleeding but we're talking of the tumor in the middle ear okay dash cranial nerve is to be earliest involved in acoustic neuroma and there is a sign where you see hypoesthesia of the wall because of the involvement of sensory division of one nerve what are these two nerves they are separate nerves what nerves are we talking about so the earliest cranial nerve to be involved is the fifth cranial nerve in acoustic neuroma and there is a sign where there is hypoesthesia of the canal posterior canal wall and the concha what is that sign called as that sign is called as hitzelberger sign so the sign is called as hitzelberger sign so hitzelberger sign is hypoesthesia in the region of the posterior wall of the external auditory canal and the region of the concha because of the involvement of the sensory division or the sensory fibers of the tri of the facial nerve so when we talk about the first nerve to be involved it is the fifth nerve and we are talking about hitzelberger sign then it is the seventh nerve okay and what is the gold standard for diagnosing acoustic neuroma what investigation will you use for diagnosing acoustic neuroma the gold standard for diagnosing acoustic neuroma is mri with contrast so on an mri with contrast you will see there is a specific sign or a radiological appearance what is that appearance yes ice cream cone appearance so ice cream cone appearance is specific for acoustic neuroma okay so i hope you have understood many signs here when we talked about glomus in glomus we talked about uh, felp sign we talked about rising sun appearance we learnt about pulsatile tinnitus and we talked about brown sign so these are all four signs that you will see in glomus tumor ice cream cone appearance hitzelberger sign earliest nerve to be involved is fifth nerve all these are the signs that you see for acoustic neuroma okay so that was a quick revision about the uh, about the uh, glomus and acoustic neuroma now dash division of the facial nerve is also called as nerve of dash so i'll give you a clue this is nerve of risberg so what is nerve of risberg it is sensory division of which nerve yes it is the sensory division of the facial nerve the facial nerve is purely sensory or is it purely motor or is it a mixed nerve so quickly answer what is the facial nerve is it sensory or is it motor or is it a mixed nerve a very very good facial nerve is a mixed nerve it has got a sensory root called as the nerve of risberg it has a motor root supplying the facial muscles and it has a secreto motor root supplying the submandibular and the sublingual salivary gland so it has got three roots which is supplying the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands the dash is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve so which nerve is called as auricular branch of the vagus nerve which is mediating the cough reflex whenever you probe the external auditory canal you see cough reflex so what is that nerve which is mediating the cough reflex and which is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve supplying the posterior wall and floor of the external auditory canal excellent all of you absolutely right this nerve is called as arnold's nerve arnold's nerve is nothing but auricular branch of the vagus nerve please remember whenever they ask you anything in relation to the ear responsible for cough reflex or responsible for syncopal reactions you have to remember about this nerve which is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve what is the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve called as tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve is called as anybody starts with j very very good this is called as jacobson's nerve so jacobson's nerve is tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve and this is associated with glomus tumor so whenever we talk about glomus tympanicum we talk about tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve which is called as the jacobson's nerve now coming to the nose upper most part of the external nose is it bony or is it cartilaginous and lower most part is it bony or is it cartilaginous how many paired bones or how many paired cartilages and how many unpaired bone and unpaired cartilages do we have 
yes very very good absolutely right all of you most of you are answering it right shri thomas avinashi shikshendu mehta yashasvi very good so upper part of the nose is bony it is about one third the lower part of the bone nose is cartilaginous and it accounts for two thirds so upper part is bony accounting to one third lower part is cartilaginous the external nose is made up of how many paired bones it is made up of two paired bones the nasal bone and the ascending process of maxilla which are paired the unpaired bone is only one which is the frontal bone then we have got cartilages we have got three paired cartilages which is upper lateral cartilage lower lateral cartilage and sesamoid cartilage and one unpaired cartilage which is the septal cartilage again this is very important because this is a little confusing and they have asked in the previous years questions on how many paired bones how many unpaired bones how many paired cartilages how many unpaired cartilages so keeping a account of it is very very important okay so let's go to the next Uh, question so last que last exam we saw disorders of smell one question was asked so let's define some of the disorders of smell what do you call complete absence of smell function what do you call this as whenever there is complete absence of smell excellent absolutely right this is called as anosmia so whenever there is a complete absence of smell we call it as anosmia if there is a decrease in the sensitivity to odor stimulus what do we call it as they can smell but there is a reduced sensitivity very very good all of you this is called as hyposmia so complete absence is anosmia decrease sensitivity to odors is hyposmia if there is increased sensitivity to common odors what do we call it as yes this we call it as hyperosmia where they have increased sensitivity to odors if there is a distorted smell or perverted smell what do we call it as yes we call it as cacosmia if all the odors are same what do we call it as heteroosmia age related decline in the perception of smell what do we call it as presbyosmia and if there is a dislike or fear of certain smells what will we call it as osmophobia yes narsimha we can call it as parosmia also distorted smell can be called as cacosmia or parosmia both can be the same okay yes so now let's go to the next question what is situated at the dash part of the nasal septum which is the most common site of epistaxis in children and young adults so which plo which plexus is present in which part of the nasal septum so what plexus is situated in the in the in the anterior part of the nasal septum i'll give away this one yes we call this as littles area also called as kieselbach's plexus so littles area also called as kieselbach's plexus is located at the anterior part of the nasal septum where all the arteries which supply the septum come and anastomose except posterior ethmoidal artery so the artery that does not anastomose is the posterior ethmoidal artery the rest of all the arteries which is anterior ethmoidal artery superior labial artery then you have got the spino palatine artery and the greater palatine artery all of them will form an arterial plexus this is called as little area also called as kieselbach's plexus this is located at the antero inferior portion of the nasal septum which is the most common site of epistaxis in children okay dash is due to persistence of the bucco nasal membrane so which congenital anomaly of the nose results due to persistence of the bucco nasal membrane where if you, if this child is born with a bilateral lesion it will result in strider and respiratory distress at birth it is cyclical so we call it as cyclical cyanosis also yes excellent very good that condition which occurs due to persistence of the bucco nasal membrane we call it as coenal atresia 
So coinal atresia occurs due to persistence of the bucconasal membrane. Here the patient, if the child is born with a bilateral coinal atresia, they will have strider. They have a condition called as cyclical cyanosis. What is cyclical cyanosis? Cyanosis at rest. And this cyanosis disappears on crying. So if there is a cyanosis at rest, and this disappears on crying we call this as we call this as cyclical cyanosis so i hope this is clear to everyone what is cyclical cyanosis okay very good we do a technique which is called as mcgowan's technique now in a patient with epistaxis dash method is used where the patient is made to sit leaning forward over the wash basin and the patient uh, is asked to spit any blood that is coming out and breathe quietly from the mouth. What do we call this as? There is a method where we ask the patient to pitch the nose, bend forward and if there is any blood we ask the patient to spit out. What is this method called as? Excellent, all of you absolutely right. This is called as Trotter's method. And in Trotter's method, the patient is made to sit and lean forward by pinching the nose. Now, what technique is used in coinal atresia? We have already discuss discussed. This technique is called as McGowan's technique, where the patient is uh, given a feeding nipple with a large hole that will provide a good airway. Okay, now what maneuver is used whenever there is an accidental inhalation of the foreign body? So, whenever there is a foreign body inhalation, what maneuver do you use? where you hold the patient from behind and give compressions on the zephy sternum so that the foreign body can be expelled out very commonly repeat question this occurs yes very good this maneuver is called as hamlet's maneuver very good so hamlet's maneuver is a maneuver that you do for accidental inhalation of the foreign body very good. Now, what maneuver is used for diagnosis of BPPV and what maneuver is used for treatment of BPPV? Again, this is a question that has occurred very, very often in the examination. They keep asking questions on this. So, which maneuver is used for diagnosis and which maneuver is used for treatment of BPPV? Very good. So, we have Dick's Halpike maneuver which is used for the diagnosis of BPPV and for treatment we have got a maneuver which is called as a please maneuver. So, for diagnosing D4D diagnosis we use Dick's Halpike and for treatment what will we use a please maneuver as simple as that. Now, this is a common question which you can expect in the exams. DASH test is used for assessing the patency of nasal valve in a patient with DASH. So you will ask the patient to breathe in and breathe out and you will pull the cheek away and ask the patient to again breathe in and breathe out. So what is that test called as? Very good. That test is called as Cottle's test and it is used to test the patency of the nasal valve in patients with a deviated nasal septum. So in patients with DNS, if you want to understand if there is a compromise of the nasal valve or not, we do this test which is called as Cottle's test. And there is a line called as Cottle's line. Okay, I am sure all of you recollect this. Okay, dash nose. Is it crooked nose, deviated nose, saddle nose or hump nose? I am giving you four options. So, what nose? The midline is straight but the tip is deviated to one side. So, in which condition will the mid nose be, uh, you know, midline is straight but the tip is deviated to one side? What will you call that nose as? Very good, very good. This is called as deviated nose. So, in a deviated nose, the nasion is in the midline, but the tip is not in the midline. In a crooked nose, the nasion is in the midline, the tip is in the midline, but the rest of the dorsum is shifted to right or shifted to left. That condition we call it as crooked nose. Now, what nose occurs due to excess bone or cartilaginous dorsum? So, if there is an excessive projection on the dorsum of the nose, what do we call it as? Yes, we call it as a hump nose deformity. So, if there is an excessive projection on the dorsum of the nose, we call it as a hump nose. But if there is a depression on the nasal dorsum, what will we call it as? If there is an excessive depression, what will we call it as? Yes, we will call that as a saddle nose deformity. So, in a saddle nose deformity, there is a depression. Whereas, in a hump nose deformity, there is an excessive projection on the dorsum of the nose. 
okay so i think this was quite easy <clears throat> okay so then you have <coughs> dash tumor also called as another name occurs due to hypertrophy of dash glands and is seen as a swelling on the tip of the nose it is usually associated with long standing cases of dash so potato nose also called as rhinophyma is a tumor due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands in patients and presents as a swelling over the tip of the nose and it is usually seen seen in cases of acne rosacea It's okay now. Should I continue? Is it okay or is it working? Not working. Okay, so I'm sorry for that disconnect in between. Uh, let's start with the session without wasting any further time. So, dash is a granulomatous condition caused by dash, which presents to you with nasal discharge, epistaxis, and nasal obstruction with a polypoidal mass resembling strawberry. So, when they have given you the word strawberry, what is it that that comes up to your head? So, what is this mass? Strawberry-like mass is a condition what we are going to talk about is rhinosporidiosis so rhinosporidiosis is a granulomatous condition caused by rhinosporidium seaberry this rhinosporidium seaberry is presents to you with epistaxis nasal discharge and a mass that resembles a strawberry now what are the findings that you would see in a patient with rhinoscleroma so on in a patient with rhinoscleroma what findings would you see Yes so biopsy findings of a patient with rhinoscleroma would show you miculic cells so whenever you see miculic cells and russell bodies so if you see the miculic cells and russell bodies you have to be sure that we are talking about rhinoscleroma so in rhinosporidiosis you will see sporangia with spores but in rhinoscleroma miculic cells and russell bodies please remember rhinoscleroma the agar that you use for culture is called as macconkey's agar so the name given to that agar is macconkey's agar Okay so what incision is used in submucosal resection of the septum and what incision is used in septoplasty so both of these surgeries are done for deviated nasal septum but what incision do you use for smr and what incision do you use for septoplasty yes so for submucosal resection of the septum we use an incision which is called as kilian's incision and for septoplasty we use an incision which is called as freer's incision so freer's incision is used for septoplasty whereas kilian's incision is used for smr now what is the incision used in maxillectomy the incision that is used in maxillectomy is called as weber ferguson's incision so the name given to this incision is called as weber ferguson's incision which is used for maxillectomy now which is a conservative surgery where mucopericondyl flap is elevated only on one side of the septum what is that surgery is it smr or is it septoplasty 
yes so septoplasty is a conservative approach where the mucopericondrial or the mucoperiosteal flap is raised only on one side of the septum we call this surgery as septoplasty okay so i think this is clear to everybody let us go to the next question what is the collection of blood between the perichondrium or the periosteum of the nasal septum so what do you call that condition very easy whenever there is a collection of blood we call it as hematoma and if there is accumulation of blood between the septum and the overlying mucoperichondrium or mucoperiosteum we call it as septal hematoma so this condition is nothing but your septal hematoma now what is the most common cause of septal perforation the most common cause of septal perforation is trauma but in syphilis if there is a septal perforation which part of the septum is involved almost all the conditions involve the cartilaginous portion of the septum except syphilis which portion is involved the bony portion of the septum is involved the other conditions whether it is lupus tuberculosis leprosy they all can cause perforation in the septum but which portion of this is involved here the cartilaginous portion is involved vaginal granulomatosis is a condition which involves the total septum so total septal perforation is seen in vaginal granulomatosis okay what is samter's triad this is a question that has been a repeat mcq before what is samter's triad so asthma aspirin sensitivity and nasal polyposis so asthma aspirin sensitivity and nasal polyposis we call this triad as samter's triad so very good most of you have answered it right so this triad is called as samter's triad okay so which is the most commonly fractured bone in the face so if you see in the face which is the most common projection which where you can see fractures most commonly yes the nasal bone is the most common site of fracture whenever we talk of fracture of the facial skeleton so in the nasal fracture what is the name given to the fracture where you have a fracture uh, you know direction of blow is from below and the fracture lines a fracture runs okay i'll give you this clue runs vertically from the anterior nasal spine upwards what is this fracture is this jarjave fracture or chevelle fracture very easy this question is so what is that fracture where you get a vertical fracture we call that fracture as a chevelle's fracture so chevelle means two vertical lines so chevelle's fracture is vertical fracture where the direction of injury will be from below resulting in a vertical fracture line it is also called as class 1 fracture if the fracture line is horizontal on the septum we call it as jarjave's fracture which is class 2 fracture okay which is the second most commonly fractured bone in the facial skeleton which fracture is the most com second most commonly fractured bone in the facial skeleton yes it is the zygomatic fracture also called as tripod fracture so zygomatic fracture there will be three fracture line zygomatico temporal zygomatico maxillary and zygomatico frontal so there will be three fracture lines so it's called as tripod fracture the second most commonly involved fracture what forceps is used to reduce the nasal bone fracture very very good which forceps is used to reduce the nasal bone fracture for septum there is one forceps for nasal bone there is one forceps so walsham's forceps is used for nasal bone very good shruti ash's forceps is used for septum so for reduction of septum you will use ash's uh, ash's uh, uh, you know ash's instrument and for walsham's forceps is used for nasal bone reduction okay what sign would you see in orbital uh, fractures or blowout fractures where the orbital contents will herniate into the maxillary antrum what is that sign called as what is that sign called as where the orbital contents will herniate what do you call that sign as yes so that sign is called as tear drop sign it is seen whenever there is a blowout fracture or a fracture of the floor of the orbit where the orbital contents will herniate into the maxillary antrum what sign is seen on a ct scan of glomus tumor very important what sign in the ct scan 
they are not asking you mri scan they are asking you on ct on ct what is the name given to that sign where there is erosion of the carotico jugular spine so whenever there is an erosion of the carotico jugular spine you get a sign on the ct which is called as very good phelps sign so phelps sign is seen on the ct scan of a patient with glomus tumor but if the same question would be what sign do you see on an mri in a glomus tumor then your answer will change the answer will be salt and pepper appearance so salt and pepper appearance is seen on an mri but phelps sign is seen on the ct in a patient with glomus tumor okay okay what is the sign where you see anterior bowing of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus and it is pathognomic of which condition this is called as very very easy sign this is called as antral sign also called as hallman miller sign very good very very good i'm seeing very nice narsimha shruti very good this hallman miller sign is a sign seen where you see anterior bowing of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus this is typical of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma okay dash classification is used for maxillary fractures where you have a horizontal fracture pyramidal fracture craniofacial disjunction what is this classification called as very very good this fractures is called as leafoot classification so leafoot's fractures are the fractures of the maxilla <clears throat> ongren's classification is used for classifying which malignancy prognosis of maxillary ethmoid frontal or sphenoid they are used for classifying maxillary carcinoma so a line from the medial canthus to angle of mandible any malignancies above this line will have a poor prognosis any malignancies below this line will have a good prognosis this line is called as ongren's line okay inverted papilloma is also called as there are so many names for this condition what all are the different names for inverted papilloma yes inverted papilloma is also called as a ringer's tumor it is also called as transitional cell papilloma yes it is also called as schneiderian papilloma so these are all the name given to the same condition okay the pharynx extends from dash to the lower border of dash cartilage so what is the superior extent of the pharynx and inferior extent of the pharynx a very basic question so the pharynx extends superiorly from base of skull inferiorly it extends up to lower border of which cartilage very good it extends up to lower border of cricoid cartilage and the pharynx continues downwards as yes it continues downwards into esophagus so superiorly lower from the base of skull inferiorly lower border of the cricoid cartilage this corresponds to the c6 vertebra so remember there are two landmarks anteriorly the lower border of cricoid posteriorly the c6 vertebra okay scattered throughout the pharynx in its sub epithelial layer is the lymphoid tissue adenoid tubule tonsils lingual tonsils which are protecting your aero digestive tract us ring ko kya kehte hai very common question mass of ring or lymphoid tissue in the upper aero digestive tract that protects your upper airway what do we call this ring as w se start hota hai very good this ring is called as waldeyer's ring so waldeyer's ring is a ling ring of sub epithelial lymphoid tissue that is present in the upper aero digestive tract okay what is the most common site for carcinoma in the nasopharynx again a very common a very repeat question which is very simple question what is the most common site of carcinoma in the nasopharynx very very good very most of you are answering it right fossa of rosenmuller so fossa of rosenmuller is the most common site for carcinoma of the nasopharynx very good what voice is a muffled and a thick speech that you see in peritonsillar abscess so what kya kehte hai wo voice ko where the voice is muffled and there is a thick speech there is a name given to this voice it there is a vegetable associated in its name and now this vegetable is hot or cold you need to decide so mai kis cheez ki baat kar rahi hu what am i talking to you about 
very good hot potato voice very very good so hot potato voice is a muffled voice where you get a thick speech often seen in peritonsillar abscess also called as quincy so peritonsillar abscess quincy you will get a hot potato voice rhinolalia aperta occurs due to hypernasal voice where there is an excessive resonance or a closed voice where there is a hyponasal voice so aperta is closed or open hypo or hyper what is aperta aperta shubham narsimha is a hypernasal voice which occurs due to palatal palsy cleft palate matlab there is a gap allowing excess air to go giving rise to excessive resonance to the voice but clausa closed closed clausa yaad rakho when the nose is closed you get this hyponasal voice so rhinolalia clausa is a hyponasal voice It can be seen in patients who have got any pathology of the nose or nasopharynx so any obstruction in the nose or nasopharynx will result in a hyponasal voice okay now what condition involves the paraspinal muscle to go into spasm and this occurs secondary to adenoidectomy isko ek syndrome kehte hai jo g se start hota hai what is that syndrome because of the adenoid there is inflammation of the paraspinal ligaments and muscles as a result there will be torticollis and stiff neck post surgery what is that syndrome called as very good this is called as grizzel syndrome <clears throat> so grizzel syndrome is not trauma it is non traumatic atlanto axial subluxation or dislocation that occurs due to spasm of the paraspinal ligaments and muscles following inflammation due to adenoidectomy a rare complication not a common complication now what cyst which represents the embryonic remnant of the notochord is present near the posterior wall of the nasopharynx where you usually see an adenoid mass kaun sa cyst starts with t jo jo chupta hai thorn ki tarah rehta hai what is that cyst yes very good this is called as thorn wold cyst so thorn wold cyst is a cyst that is located at the region of the adenoid represents the embryonic remnant of the notochord what is the main arterial supply of the tonsil tonsil is supplied by which main artery yes it is supplied by tonsillar artery and tonsillar artery is a branch of yes so tonsillar artery is a branch of your facial artery again this is a simple question but this was a question in the previous exams which is why i have told discussed it here now the bed of tonsil is formed by dash and dash muscles at least tell me one that will be enough it is mainly the superior constrictor muscles sometimes you have the styloglossus also that is there in the bed of the tonsil for now even if you forget that it's okay but remember superior constrictor is forming the bed of the tonsil now which space is divided into two lateral compartments by a median raphe is it the para uh, parapharyngeal space retropharyngeal space prevertebral space or the peritonsillar space which space is called as space of gillette yes very good we have the retropharyngeal space these retropharyngeal spaces are paired spaces on either side of the midline which are separated by a median raphe and they are called as space of gillet danger space so when i talk to you of retropharyngeal space we have got two fascia which form the boundary of the retropharyngeal space anteriorly buccopharyngeal fascia posteriorly prevertebral fascia and this space is your retropharyngeal space so what is this fascia dividing the retropharyngeal space into two compartments this fascia is called as alar fascia the compartment that is present anteriorly this compartment is called as the true retropharyngeal space the posterior compartment is called as danger space so danger space is located between alar fascia anteriorly and the prevertebral fascia posterior so easy what is danger space yes now dash causes nasopharyngeal carcinoma and dash causes inverted papilloma
I am waiting for your answer. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is most commonly caused by which virus? Yes, Epstein Barr virus. Again, a very, very important question. Epstein Barr virus causes nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And what, what causes inverted papilloma? HPV, human papilloma virus, causes inverted papilloma. We have already done the most common site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is Fosa of Rosenmuller. Okay, dash is the most common presenting feature of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So, they present to you with either bleeding or nasal obstruction or lymphadenopathy. What is the most common presenting feature of a nasopharyngeal cancer? It is cervical lymphadenopathy so they when there is a small lesion the nasopharynx is rich in lymphatic so they present to you with lymph nodes in the trotter's triad so cervical lymphadenopathy is the most common presenting feature yes yes we epistaxis is the most common feature of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma we are talking about carcinoma so in a carcinoma the most common presenting feature is cervical lymphadenopathy okay and unilateral som in a juvenile age group you'll think of angiofibroma but if there is an older patient you'll think of carcinoma and if there is a som what type of graph would you see on a tympanometry you'll see a type b so we have in tympanometry a as a d b and c a is normal a s is seen in autosclerosis a d is seen in ossicular discontinuity flat line or a b type of graph is seen in fluid and c type in eustachian tubal obstruction so since npc causes som serous otitis media where there is fluid you will get a b type of a tympanogram okay what is the branch of dash nerve that is involved in trotter's triad so in trotter's triad what are the components let's leave the branch but let's go to the trotter's triad in trotter's triad you will see unilateral conductive hearing loss there is fifth nerve involvement and there is tenth nerve involvement this triad is called as trotter's triad and the treatment of choice for nasopharyngeal carcinoma is radiation therapy in advanced cases chemo rt but in most cases it is radiation therapy okay Okay, angiofibroma histologically is it a benign tumor or a malignant tumor? Very simple, I am sure all of you are answering it right. <clears throat> Good, absolutely right. It's a benign tumor, but it is a locally invasive tumor. So, angiofibroma is benign, but it is locally invasive, and the most common site of origin is from which foramen? very very good it originates from the sphenopalatine foramen this sphenopalatine foramen is located near the posterior wall of maxillary sinus about 8 to 10 mm behind the middle terminate okay what is the most common presentation of angiofibroma now you tell me we learned the presentation of carcinoma cervical lymphadenopathy right so what will be the most common presentation of an angiofibroma Yes, the most common presentation of angiofibroma is epistaxis. Recurrent, unprovoked, profuse epistaxis is a feature that you see in angiofibroma. The investigation of choice for an angiofibroma, is it CT, is it MR, is it, uh, what do you do, what is the investigation of choice? Yes, very, very good. The investigation of choice is a contrast enhanced CT scan. That will tell you the extent of the disease. It will tell you the vascularity and the erosions. You can do an MRI to study the extent of spread. You can do an angiography to identify the feeding vessel to the tumor. But what is the investigation of choice? It is the contrast enhanced CT scan. Okay. Okay, what is the treatment of choice for a JNA? The treatment of choice for JNA is embolization followed by surgical excision. So, embolization followed by surgical excision is the treatment of choice for JNA. So, NPC, JNA, gloma, acoustic, anatomy of ear, anatomy of nose, conditions of the nose. We have revised quite a bit so far. Let's go to some of the laryngeal lesions. What type of strider is seen in supraglottic lesions? Any lesion above the vocal cord will result in what type of strider? Yes. 
yes very good inspiratory stridor occurs whenever there is a supraglottic lesion but what type of stridor that occurs in thoracic trachea bronchus what type of stridor occurs in these lesions very very good excellent all of you you get an expiratory stridor what type of stridor is seen if there is a lesion at the level of vocal cords subglottis and cervical trachea very very good again everyone is right biphasic stridor so upper airway inspiratory lower airway expiratory in between the two biphasic okay now what is the most common congenital anomaly of the larynx that can cause stridor and here you get a typical shape of the epiglottis what are we talking about i know everyone will answer this very quickly we are talking about laryngomalacia so laryngomalacia is a condition which is the most common congenital cause of stridor and on examination the epiglottis is curled upon itself what do you call this as excellent all of you omega shaped epiglottis is the uh, sign that you see now what is the grading system that we use for subglottic stenosis there is a name given for inict this is important but for the rest of them it's not really important so what grading do we use for subglottic stenosis yes this is called as cotton myers classification so cotton myers classification is used for subglottic stenosis so whenever there is a subglottic stenosis the name given to this classification is called as cotton myers classification okay now the next question what is the safety muscle of the larynx the most important question which is the only abductor of the vocal cord yes very very good the safety muscle of the larynx is posterior cricoarytenoid the safety muscle is your posterior cricoarytenoid now what is the only muscle that is lying outside the laryngeal framework and not having dual innervation but has got two bellies okay so i'll just cut this it is having two bellies what is that muscle that lies outside the laryngeal framework having two bellies which is the tensor of the vocal cord what am i talking about yes very good this is your cricothyroid muscle <clears throat> okay so stridor is a feature of which nerve palsy superior laryngeal nerve palsy recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy which nerve palsy will result in stridor or a combined palsy where there is sln and rln palsy yes so stridor is a feature of bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy okay not unilateral but bilateral rln palsy in an emergency if you have to get an access to the airway and you know you can't perform a tracheostomy it's a cannot intubate cannot ventilate situation then how will you access the airway through which membrane thyrohyoid membrane cricothyroid membrane cricotracheal membrane which membrane will you use to pierce the airway yes very good this is called as cricothyrotomy so you will pierce the cricothyroid membrane in an emergency to get an access to the airway okay pitch and tone of the voice are affected in which nerve palsy so in which nerve palsy will you see that the pitch of the voice is getting affected the tone of the voice is getting affected whenever we speak whenever we want to have a tone there has to be a tensor function right so which muscle palsy will result in loss of the tensor function and what is the nerve supplying that muscle excellent superior laryngeal nerve palsy the tensor function the cricothyroid loses its nerve supply and hence the pitch and tone of the voice will get affected now galen's anastomosis is an anastomosis that you see on the larynx between the internal laryngeal nerve which is a branch of the superior laryngeal nerve and anastomosis between the ascending branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve so this anastomosis is a sensory anastomosis or a motor anastomosis yes very good galen's anastomosis is a purely sensory anastomosis it is not a motor anastomosis okay now tuberculosis affects which portion of the larynx does it affect the anterior portion of the larynx or the posterior portion of the larynx yes very good tuberculosis affects the posterior portion of the larynx okay 
vocal nodule and vocal polyp occur at the junction of which part of the vocal cord do they occur at the junction of anterior one third and middle one third or posterior one third and the middle one third where do you get the vocal nodule and vocal polyp at what junction they are seen at the junction of <coughs> anterior one third and middle one third So, Mohammad Javed, palatal palsy which occurs due to diphtheria. The first thing that has to be done is to give an anti diphtheric serum and also give IV antibiotics. Since the nerve is already paralyzed, involvement of nerve has already occurred, the prognosis is not really good. But typical treatment is to start with IV antibiotics and start with anti diphtheric serum. Okay. Now, sessile is a vocal nodule and pedunculated is a vocal polyp. Where do you get diplophonia or double voice? Diplophonia is a feature of vocal polyp. So, diplophonia is a feature that you see in vocal polyp. Microlaryngeal surgery is the treatment of choice for a nodule or for a polyp? For both you will do but for nodule you initially give wait and watch. If it doesn't resolve then you are going to do a microlaryngeal surgery. But it is the treatment of choice for a patient with vocal polyp. You will not give voice rest because in a polyp it won't resolve. So microlaryngeal surgery will be the treatment of choice in a vocal polyp. Ulcer on one side and heaped up epithelium on one side which we call it as contact ulcer kissing ulcer what is that condition called as this condition is called as pachyderma laryngitis this condition is called as pachyderma laryngitis also called as contact ulcer also called as kissing ulcer so contact ulcer kissing ulcer pachyderma laryngitis all of them mean the same okay Microlaryngeal surgery involves using the microscope to excise the lesions on the vocal cords which has a focal length of how much? The focal length is 400 nanometers. So this is the focal length that we use for doing a microlaryngeal surgery. <coughs> okay. The next question. Gutsman pressure test is used for the diagnosis of? So during puberty, there has to be a change in voice in males. If there is no change in voice, we apply pressure on the thyroid cartilage, on the Adam's apple. And we ask the patient to speak. On compressing, there is an improvement in the voice. This test, we call it as Gutsman pressure test. So it is used in which condition? Yes, very good. It is used for the diagnosis of puberphonia. <coughs> Keyhole appearance of the vocal cord where you have an appearance due to weakness of the thyroarytenoid muscle anteriorly and the interarytenoid muscle posteriorly resulting in a keyhole like appearance. This is seen in which condition? Weakness of the muscles we call it as phonoasthenia. Whenever there is weakness of the phonatory muscle, there will be keyhole appearance of the vocal cord. So in phonoasthenia, you get the keyhole appearance of the vocal cord. Adductor spasmodic dysphonia occurs due to spasm of which muscle? So there is spasm because of which there is a dysphonia or change in voice. So in this adductor spasmodic dysphonia, which muscle is undergoing spasm resulting in change of voice? Yes, it is your thyroarytenoid muscle. So this thyroarytenoid muscle, if it undergoes spasm, the vocal cords will not be able to vibrate smoothly. There will be a spastic movement resulting in a change in voice. So they will have a choked, strangulated, croaky, scratchy, this kind of a voice. Abductor spasmodic dysphonia, when the abduction happens, the vocal cord will go into spasm. And what is that muscle responsible for causing abduction? It is your posterior cricoarytenoid. So, abductor spasmodic dysphonia occurs due to spasm of the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. Okay. The treatment is botulinum toxin which you have to inject in the respective muscles because it's a neurological disorder, it's not a local laryngeal pathology. 
ओके नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन वॉट इज द इटियोलॉजी फॉर विंसेंट्स एंजाइना विंसेंट्स एंजाइना अकर्स ड्यू टू अ स्पाइरोट विच इज कॉल्ड एज बोरेलिया विंसेंटी सो द स्पाइरोट इन्वॉल्व इन द कॉजेशन ऑफ विंसेंट्स एंजाइना इज बोरेलिया विंसेंटी now there is a condition called as ludwig sanchaina which is the cellulitis of the floor of mouth here we get a feel what is that feel called as woody hard feel so woody hard feel on palpation is a feature that you see in ludwig sanchaina very good sahu patel what muscle divides the submandibular space into two compartments very very good it is the mylohyoid muscle very good a a shruti ashi very good so mylohyoid muscle divides the submandibular space into the two compartments so ashi shahu it's not omohyoid it is mylohyoid okay if airway is endangered in a patient with ludwig sanchaina what will you do will you try to intubate or will you do a tracheostomy it is impossible to intubate because the tongue will have already gone upwards and backwards obstructing the airway so if the airway is endangered the treatment is tracheostomy because it is very difficult to intubate this patient okay what are the two parts of your inferior constrictor muscle so inferior constrictor has got oblique fibers of one muscle and there are horizontal fibers of another muscle so what is this oblique fibers the oblique fibers are that of thyropharynges and the horizontal fibers are that of your cricopharynges in between them there is an area of dehiscence what is this area of dehiscence called as anybody yes this area of dehiscence is called as kilian's dehiscence and if there is an outpouching of mucosa through this kilian's dehiscence very good yashas we ashi jitain sahu we call it as zenker's diverticulum now zenker's diverticulum is a pseudo diverticulum it is not a true diverticulum so zenker's diverticulum is a pseudo diverticulum now what is the diagnostic test for diagnosing csf rhinorrhea which investigation will tell you that this is not nasal fluid and this is csf which investigation yes it is beta 2 transferrin so the presence of beta 2 transferrin will tell you if this fluid that is coming out of the nose is csf or not very good onodi cell is an anterior cell or posterior cell and it is seen in relation to which nerve <clears throat> so onodi cell is a posterior ethmoidal cell which extends into the sphenoid sinus and it is related to a nerve which nerve it is optic nerve okay so onodi cell is in relation to the optic nerve infra orbital cell yashasvi is your haller cell okay onodi cell is posterior cell now the objective test done to assess the respiratory function of the nose or the nasal airway this test is called as a rhino manometry all the other tests that we do like the cotton wool test the cold spatula test all of them are subjective test the objective test that we do to assess the respiratory function of the nose we call it as rhino manometry lotten slager's operation it is a operation where you medialize the lateral wall of the nose so if this is the nose this is our lateral wall which has the turbinates so if i medialize the lateral wall of the nose and i will make the nasal cavity narrower i will call the surgery as adlotten slager's operation very good shruti it is done for atrophic rhinitis so lotten slager's operation is done for atrophic rhinitis vidya neurectomy is done in which condition where there is a you know autonomic imbalance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system resulting in symptom that condition we call it as non allergic rhinitis also called as vasomotor rhinitis so for this we will be doing vidya neurectomy so sahu yes young's operation is done modifies young's operation is done lotten slager's operation all these operations are done for atrophic rhinitis okay what is tespal stands for tespal stands for transnasal 
endoscopic spinopalatine artery ligation so test palace transnasal endoscopic spinopalatine artery ligation done for patients with epistaxis floating palate and floating teeth are features of lee fort one fracture where there is a horizontal fracture going through the floor of the nose and floor of the maxillary sinus we call it as lee fort one fracture with where you get floating palate and floating teeth ashi lee fort three is cranio facial disjunction so the cranial cavity and the facial cavity get disconnected that is lee fort three guardsman fracture is a type of mandibular fracture where there is fracture of the symphysis menti and bilateral subcondylar region so that fracture is called as guardsman fracture and what is the artery of epistaxis i'm sure all of you know it it is the spino palatine artery so with this i finished the quick discussion of 100 one liners and tried my best to put in all of the uh, you know important topics in one go i didn't want to take a longer time but unfortunately because of some error, you know connection problems in the earlier part of the class i there was some lag but i think the later part went well so i'm sorry for that little bit of you know error or lag it was absolutely not under my control but uh, i hope such things do not occur but these things i mean we nobody can predict and I'm actually very sorry for that disturbance that has happened hope you learned enough from this class for today wishing you good luck wishing you the best and i'm hoping that all of you do really well in your exams okay so take care and bye